Hello, I am Peg DeSanto, and I am presenting a shortened version of the talk I normally give to B-Clubs to give you an idea about the content. I will be going over the scientific data comparing the effectiveness of a vented hive versus a condensing hive, and give an intro to the hive hugger insulation system we created, which did win the ABF Innovation Award in 2023. Perhaps some of you know the heartbreak of opening up your hives in the spring to find that they did not survive. I am from Minnesota, and year after year, I was losing about half of my hives every winter. And I learned I was not alone. 50, 50 to 60% colony loss is the average in northern climates. I tried multiple different winterization systems. These are not my hives, but they could be because I tried many of these techniques. Including straw bales. What strikes me most as I look at these photos is we beekeepers will go through great lengths to try to protect our bees in the winter. And we struggle with just how best to do this. Something inside me said, can't we do better by our bees? And as good fortune would have it, around this time, I started dating a man who owns a business in high-tech installation. Together, we teamed up and set out on a mission to develop the most effective winterization system ever made. I have been a registered nurse for 37 years. I worked in the intensive care unit, emergency room, chemotherapy. Everything we do in medicine to save lives is based in science. And so as we start out at, started out in this quest to save honeybee lives, it was also very important that it was founded in science. We collaborated with engineers in thermodynamics as well as well-known researchers like Bill Heshbeck, Randy Oliver, Etienne Tardif. And we did a deep dive into reviewing the science done on overwintering honeybees. And what stri struck us most is that the science is plentiful, it's consistent, it's current, and it's gotten pretty high tech. Uh, we have access to information that we just didn't have years ago. For example, infrared thermal imaging, we can see where the cluster is, if there's areas of heat loss coming out of the hive. And then there's the whole world of sensors. These sensors can tell you the temperature and relative humidity in your hive every 10 minutes. Etienne Tardif is known to put 20 sensors in a single hive and then um, change the winterization system and repeat this for multiple hives. And then he gets good comparative data on the different winterization systems. And as a result, he gets literally millions of data points. This is one of his slides. And so the point is like the thermodynamics inside of a beehive are no longer a mystery. The science informs us as to really what is the optimal way to overwinter our honeybees. And be before I share what that optimal approach is, I want to go over some of the thermodynamics behind that overwintering approach. What does the literature say is the biggest threat to our honeybees in the winter? Is it wet bees, the moisture, or is it the cold? And from what I've learned, it's both. And it's very important to solve for both. First, moisture. How do we solve for moisture? First, I think it's important to even talk about like, how does the moisture even get it into the hive? And what, what happens is when the bees consume honey, a byproduct of their metabolism is water vapor. And when that exhaled water vapor hits a surface in the hive that's cold enough to be at the dew point, and that water vapor turns into liquid water and starts condensing down on our bees, from the ceiling, wet bees are dead bees. So what do many beekeepers do to solve for this moisture problem? They ventilate. 
they drill holes in the hive boxes or put on a quilt box with holes in it. But according to Derek Mitchell, who has his PhD in thermal fluids at Leeds University, when we create an upper entrance, the chimney or stacking effect occurs and the moist air gets vented out the upper entrance. And as a result, uh, cold, dry air comes in the lower entrance and then replaces that warm, moist air. And so, yes, upper entrances get rid of moisture, but in doing so, they also get rid of heat, precious heat. And why do I say precious heat? Well, because the heater bees work really hard to generate it. As you know, at around 50 to 55 degrees, the bees go into a cluster, queen is in the middle, and then the heater bees vibrate their wing muscles to generate heat. Here's a thermographic image of a heater bee. If some of you opened your hives and found these bees with their bottoms poking out, those are, those are heater bees. And what can happen is the, the heater bees can work themselves to death. The metabolic stress can lead to metabolic death. In fact, Derek Mitchell goes on to say that the cluster is actually a survival mechanism we beekeepers impose on the bees by ventilating and not providing enough insulation. Etienne Tardif, who's in the Yukon, says in his well-insulated, non-ventilated hives, the bees' resting metabolism is adequate to maintain the internal environment which means they don't cluster at all, as in this photo. The heat generated by the basic metabolism of just living life is enough to support their hive. There's no need to cluster and vibrate their wing muscles to generate heat. When we ventilate our hives and expose them to that cold, it causes a lot of very detrimental, detrimental effects on the colony. At 50 to 55 degrees, the bees start to cluster, but at 14 degrees, that cluster reaches maximum tightness. And so if the cold threat persists and it can't get any tighter, that outer, outer layer of bees will go into a chill coma and drop off the hive until you have a pile of, drop off the cluster until you have a pile of dead bees at the bottom of your hive. Or that cluster is so tight because of the cold, they can't even move an inch away from their honey. And it's a common misconception for people to say, oh, well, they starved to death. No, they froze to death because they were too cold to move to get to their food. But starving to death is a common outcome of, of cold bees as well. What that looks like is they just end up consuming a a bunch of honey for energy to stay warm and can de deplete your entire honey stores that you left for the winter and then starve to death. And another negative effect of all that honey consumption is without opportunities for cleansing flights, they risk dysentery and spreading nosema. A study done by the USDA last year um, says that Cold bees have weaker immune systems, that the energy of overwintering bees used to maintain their hive temperature reduces the energy available to them for immune function, which means they're more susceptible to diseases and infections, which all leads to higher winter mortality. Another effect of cold on our bees happens in the spring. In fact, it's the time of the year with the highest colony mortality rate, which is very confusing and frustrating for beekeepers. What happens is in the spring when the queen starts laying eggs, these old tired worker bees now have to, have to activate their glands to take care of the baby bees and then heat the brood to 95 degrees. And if there's a, a cold snap and they can't um, maintain that 95 degrees, They'll simply quit trying, and without replacement brood, the whole hive will die. Another negative effect of um, venting on our hives, it actually gets rid of valuable moisture that we want to keep in the hive. The bees need water in the winter. They use it to dilute and consume honey and remain hydrated. 
So yes, venting does get rid of moisture, but in doing so, it actually hurts our bees. It gets rid of precious water and leads to life-threatening cold exposure. And it looks like the bees agree. You see photos of them um, propolizing up their vents. This is, this is an epime hive. So the common question people ask at this point is without venting, how do we manage moisture in the hive? And the answer is you insulate, but in a very specific way. The key is to super insulate the top of the hive to keep it above the dew point. You also insulate the walls of the hive, but less so that when the moisture does condense, which it will, because we want it to, it will condense on the cooler walls. And remember, in a really well-insulated hive, the bees don't cluster at all. They're free to move around in the hive and then walk over to the walls where there's water condensing for them to drink. So with this setup, the bees stay warm. They're well-insulated. There's no cold air coming in through holes in the hive. They, they stay dry because the top of the ceiling super insulated, stays above the dew point. And so the key to solving for both is a condensing hive setup. This study was done at the University of Illinois and it basically compared well-insulated hives with non-insulated hives. And the well-insulated hives had a 22.5% improval in overall colony survival. They had a two-fold reduction in bee population decline Remember, cold bees work harder and can, that metabolic stress can lead to metabolic death. And the insulated hives consumed significantly less, less food stores. Another study uh, done, this was by Tom Seeley, who has his PhD at Cornell University. He asked the question, bees survive winters in tree cavities. So what are the qualities of these natural hives? And he found out, indeed, they are condensing hives. They have an infinite amount of insulation above the colony, keep it above the dew point. And then they also, um, the, the trees have very thick, solid walls and entrances only at the bottom. Then in 2022, he did a deeper dive and asked, well, what would it take to make our Langstroth hives much more like a natural home for a honeybee. And it came, with, came up with specific R values. They recommended R value of 30 on the ceiling and R10 on the walls. And again, no upper entrances. And this study was done in climate zone five. Etienne Tardif, who again lives in the Yukon, climate zone one, two, and he gets um, 90 to 100% survival, which tells you something. He too, R30, top of the hive, R10 to 12 on the sidewalls, no upper entrances, and uses a condensing wall on purpose. So again, Etienne uses condensing hive approach. So um, the hive hugger system, you know, before, uh, we talk about this uh, approach to winterizing, we wanted to just review the science uh, behind condensing hives because I know it's a bit of a paradigm shift. So I don't expect people to just adopt a new way of overwintering without understanding the science behind it. So our system has two components, a top panel and then the side wraps. So the top panel is made of a product called a vacuum insulation panel. It has the highest R value of any material ever created. And the reason for that is in a vacuum, no air molecules exist. And so very minimal heat transfer can take place. Vacuum insulation panels are 10 times more efficient than traditional materials like foam boards and fiberglass. Refrigerators with these panels use 50% less energy Shipping containers can keep uh, cargo at a constant temperature for like up to five days. 
Yeti is putting these insulation panels in their coolers, um, their $800 vacuum insulation coolers. So they're used in a lot of industries where you want really high R value, but you don't have a lot of space. And now they have made it to the B industry. So our panel uh, is custom cut to uh, deliver an R32 based on what science recommends for northern climates. And it it's, fits nicely over the wooden inner cover, and then your telescoping cover would go over that. And so again, we want the high R value on the top to keep the ceiling above the dew point. Also, 75% of the heat loss is from the top of the hive, and so that's where you'd want your heavy hitter insulation. These panels are very compact. Here's a photo of three vacuum insulation panels compared to the equivalent of what that would take um, in foam board. They're mouse and ant proof and eco-friendly. No toxic chemicals go into making them. The second component of the hive hugger system is the wrap, which goes around the walls of the hive. The wrap is made of one and a half inch polystyrene. It comes in uh, two different densities, which can yield an R7 or an R8. And then you add the hive box, gives it an 8-9, which is approaching the 10 that's recommended. They are professionally water jet cut to fit together like puzzle pieces. So they're super easy to assemble, disassemble, and stack for storage. So um, some of the research we've done, and this is our third year of testing and our first year of actually actual sales. Um, the hive hugger hives are getting over 90% survival. They keep the hives 20 to 30 degrees warmer than other common winterization methods. They can, the bees consume 30 to 50% less honey. They, um, the, the colonies come through spring much, much stronger and they're, they're earlier to brood. So the takeaways, uh, the scientific literature as well as our own research shows that in well insulated condensing hive setups, just a, a, a bunch of benefits, again, less winter mortality, stronger spring colonies, queen lays earlier, and significantly less honey consumption. And then the bees have access to the much needed water. So um, we have had last year, I mentioned our first year of sales, over 500 customers spread out of over 42 states in the US, including three provinces in Canada. And um, we've received many, many emails from very satisfied customers. They are getting overwintering successes like never before. So if you want any more information about the products, you can go to our website, hivehugger.com, or feel free to email us, um, be the change mn at gmail.com. So if your bee club would be interested in having us give the longer version of this talk, which is closer to 45 minutes, um, goes into deeper detail, um, please reach out. We would love to meet you all and, and share uh, what we've come up with. Oh, uh, lastly, I do have a list of our references if you guys want to look into the research yourself. Again, thank you very much.